Take up the broken sword of your father. And strike down the darkness. Amen. Greetings, everyone. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Nick. And we are the Goslings, a digital speakeasy of free thinkers, Christian authors, explorers of the esoterica, and general purveyors of buffoonery. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we have an amazing interview and conversation for you. Uh, but if you would, first, it really, really helps us if you would take up the broken sword of your finger, strike down that subscribe button, and while you're down there, tingle that bell. Yeah, yeah, give that bell a gentle caress, or <laughs> keep your YouTube pimp hands strong and smack that bell. Smack <laughs> it like it owes you money. That's right, and if you've already done those things, well, first of all, thank you, yes. uh, but also if you hit the like button, that would really, really help us because it shows the algorithm that you like this video and other people who have shared interest will also like it. That would help tremendously. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Uh, leave a comment, share it with your friends, send it to your enemies, <laughs> do all the things. That's right. Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> and without further ado, here is uh, this video's conversation and interview. We hope you guys enjoy it. That's right. Vertical bunch. Whoosh. Your YouTube feed is crap. Stop wasting your time watching bot-boosted shills and self-appointed gurus cloying for your attention. Instead, join the Goslings interview, live stream, and podcast. The Goslings, a dark lit digital speakeasy of free thinkers, a super chat of radical truth seeking wizards who eat trolls for second breakfast. Topics that'll make your mama's hair stand on end, ideas that'll make your pastor's knees knock, guests that will illuminate the hidden chambers of your mind, and interviews that strike down the darkness. Welcome to the Goslings. Stephen Pressfield, author of the brand new book, The Daily Pressfield. Absolutely powerful and motivational 365 day manual that can be started anytime during the year. Don't wait for January 1st. How you doing, Uncle Steve? And uh, what uh, caused you to uh, create the daily press field? Uh, uh, that's it. What's first? To, it's great to see you guys again. You know, I know we've been saying that for the last, you know, just uh, before the, the tape recorder started. Um, you know, a, a few, I don't know why, but lately, a number of people kind of come to me and said, or by email or whatever, I, I want to write a book and I don't know how to start. I don't know how to do, what do I do? How do I do this, you know? And uh, so I thought that I've got, you know, lots of, like stuff in one book or in another book, in the war of art and the artist's journey and, you know, do the work, you know, bits and pieces here and there, but nothing is actually structured to sort of help somebody from A to Z, right? And a 365 day format of, you know, the daily whatever is, is a really good way to do that, I think. So the that was the reason of the book, as you know, it kind of starts day one, like when you open your eyes on the first day, that's like where the, the chapter one is you open your eyes. And the first thing that happens is resistance with a capital R hits you, you know, and uh, so then the book will hopefully will take somebody, let's say somebody wanted to write a novel or a screenplay or some long form year long thing. But they could start at day one in the daily press field and kind of go through the whole book. And it would kind of each each week is on a different theme and sort of helps you through. Like in particular, the middle of the book is about act two horrors. Right. And those that stage that you all get We all get in when the thing falls apart, you know, yeah, and at amen, the end brother. of the book, it's more it's about it starts to ask the question of. What do we do if this thing fails? What do we do if we never succeed? Why are we in this in the first place? You know, and it kind of ends on the idea of of writing or any creative enterprise as a practice, you know, as something that you're going to do for its own sake, no matter what. And um, yeah. so anyway, it's sort of a, a 365 day discipline, you know, motivator thing. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, it's you know, it's similar to like in in uh, Christian publishing. Uh, there are devotionals. There are daily devotionals. Ah, yeah. You know, passage of what scripture. Is, from what the exactly old... is a devotional, Nick? 
Hey well, everyone, I'm Jonathan Goss with the Gosslings. Give your inner Christian warrior something to really gravitate towards and feed upon with Heavenly Realms, a series of seven novels about angelic warfare written by me, yours truly. It is masculine, warrior-based fiction that is biblically based, but is extremely gratifying for the warrior in all of you. It is available on Amazon in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. If you like it, leave a review. If you you want signed copies you can always email us at the goslings group at gmail.com and i would really love to hear from you again heavenly realms by jonathan goss available on amazon check it out well in uh you know in publishing terms it's a book where you have every day you have a maybe a section of the old testament or a section of the New Testament, just a couple verses from each, and maybe a short commentary. It might be on maybe a page, maybe two pages, and that's it. A daily digest, if you will, of scripture and some commentary on it by a theologian mm -hmm. or pastor or what have you. It's just a day by day, and, and they make devotionals, which are 365 day walkthroughs of the entire Bible, where they take uh -huh. it and put it in chronological order. Yeah, and every day you just read, you know, that particular group of passages coupled with like sort of a, a meditative excerpt or yeah. something to contemplate uh, yeah. and yeah. you know very very similar to the art of war and the war of art and you know sort of ah. and then a little bit of like the cones and there yeah ah. well and that's what the daily press field is i didn't know what the name of a devotional <laughs> was yeah it's a bit like the yeah. course of miracles right where you have a you know, a thought at the top of the page, and then there's mm -hmm. below that is kind of commentary of what this really means in your daily life is this. Yeah. In a way, it's a, also a bit like a horoscope, right? Where you pick up a thing that says, you know, today you're going to meet a stranger, whatever, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 But it but sets the... your mind for the day on a particular thought, you know, and, and ho hopefully that helps. Yeah, it does. Um, the daily press field has been, really great for me like shaking the rust off you know i mean i've been i mean resistance has been kicking my ass steve this whole year i should have been done with this editing this book i hate editing it's like the final phase sucks and i have been behind the eight ball for like six months until i started digging into this and now all of a sudden it's like okay one chapter a day i can edit one <laughs> chapter a day yeah you know and like so there's there's power behind that like those little incremental things you know, it, you can't just go into the gym and lift 300 pounds on the bench rest. You know, you got to you got to start with the pink weight somewhere, man. You know, so it's that. Yeah. What about Bob thing? Baby steps, you know, mm -hmm. baby steps around the. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, talk a little bit about the uh, companion uh, journal uh, that you send along with the book. Well, one of the things that we try to do, this is my girlfriend, Diana and me, who she's like the brains of the outfit, you know, Um was since we're sort of we're self-publishing this book you know it's on amazon but it's we're really bringing it out which so we had this sort of concept of trying to give of publishing above and beyond so that those four things that are behind you guys if if you it's available book is available to be ordered that way in a kind of a deluxe thing that has all kinds of support to it you know that it's not just a book and that's it and so that that's a companion journal, sort of like the artist's way, you know, where um, because it is a 365 day book that hopefully you can use as you're writing your book or your screenplay or your record album or whatever it is that you're doing, that you can kind of keep notes as you go along. You know, today I did this. The next day I did that. I fell down in this, you know, like for the gym. I don't know if you guys do this. I keep a little diary every day, you know, of exactly what I did and, you know, where I screwed up and, you know, what went wrong that day and, <laughs> and what I'm trying to accomplish. And it's, and it's very helpful, you know, because a lot of times I think like for the gym or for writing for me, I'll sort of finish the day. And if I don't think about it, you know, and sort of write something down, it's sort of like a goes away in a way whatever lessons i should have learned I, f I forget them you know but if i write it down i go oh okay that was what happened today you know i i've been trying to do blah blah blah, blah but now i got it this <laughs> anyway so that's what that little companion journal is for just to kind of reinforce 
uh, a person's progress as they're working on whatever their thing is. This is such a genius addition <clears throat> because they've proven, you know, one of the reasons why school children are having so much trouble uh, with memory retention is that they've proven that actually writing things down does help cause a physiological link to the memory as opposed to just typing you know? Oh, is uh, that right? Huh? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's, it, you know, teachers caught some flack for doing away with cursive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think probably like a decade mm -hmm. or two ago. And then um, they kind of didn't really bring back cursive a whole lot. So like, if you uh -huh. know how to write cursive, it's a secret language that we can all use now. No uh, one else yeah, will be yeah. able to read it if they're under 30, you know? Uh, but they did uh, catch more flack when they took away actual handwriting in general and just went totally digital. You know, so it's true, like trying to retain a memory without writing something down or a thought or whatever, especially as a writer, where it's just this bubbling cauldron of ideas all the time. It's like trying <laughs> to put smoke in your pocket, Yeah, you know, yeah. and it, you can't. So this I have gotten so much out of this, this little journal and the pages are small. So they force you to be like laconic yeah, and you're yeah. writing you really write very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smart moves. I've Steve. been uh, writing down my daily word count at the bottom ah, as great. well. Along with my thoughts, I'm on page 19, uh, uh, excuse me, day 19. Hmm. Uh, and uh, we're talking about, so week three, you're talking about the fool's cap method. Uh, and uh, I have been really struggling to like put something into the fool's cap method, right? To put it on a page. Uh -huh. And uh, this book helped me do that. And I have an idea that's now, you know, I basically fool's capped out this, this idea that I'm, that I might run with. Uh, one of my one of my questions for you was, um, do you have fool's cap pages filled out for stories that you never ended up writing? Yeah. Uh, ah, that's a great question, Nick. Uh, actually, no. <laughs> uh, it's like, <laughs> like by the time I get to the point of I'm actually going to write a thing down on a single page and new idea, it's usually solid enough in my mind that I'm kind of committed to it. So by the time it gets done as a fool's cap, if it works, then I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll stick with it. You know, so I, I, uh, I won't throw something away. I won't, I won't have, I won't even write something that I will throw away. If you know what I mean? That's interesting. So, uh, you, you, you fool's cap something after the point you've determined that it's worth pursuing in a way, or, yeah. or does the fool's cap method kind of help validate that for you? It helps validate that, but usually I've sort of done it in my head first enough that I know, okay, now let me let me kind of formalize it on the, on paper. Um, but definitely that the method, is, the whole point of it is to sort of be able to evaluate an idea. You know, by the time you've got that one page written where you can look at it and say, this is worth doing or this is not worth doing. Should we explain a little bit about what the fool's cap method is or? Do... Yeah. One of our best conversations that we've had was purely about the fool's cap method. Ah, okay. Then and I, won't, you go... I won't go into it again. Oh, well, no, it'd be good to give uh, anybody new who's come along, uh, maybe just like a primer on the fool's cap because you codify the fool's cap in such an amazing way. You do it on your Instagram channel. You've done it in other interviews. It's really impressive stuff. Well, yeah, the gist of it, what fool's cap is, is this like a yellow legal pad is is a fool's cap page, you know? And uh, one of my great mentors, Norm Stahl, once took me out to lunch. I know you guys know this story. <laughs> and uh, I was completely lost in, in space trying to start a, a novel. And he said to me, Steve, God made a single sheet of fool's cap to be exactly the right length to hold the entire outline of a novel. And I, that was like a real breakthrough for me. In other words, the concept of the fool's cap page is to put everything on one page, including the, the ending of the book, you know, so that, and so I have various points that I, that I've evolved over the years, like who's the hero, who's the villain, what genre is it? You know, is it a love story? Is it a Western? Is it a space story? What's the narrative device? Who tells the story? Uh, what, what's what's the what's act one what's act two what's act three and what's the climax and a bunch of other things not that many about a dozen that you can write down on one line and um, they give you kind of an x-ray of of an idea you know once you've sort of answered all those questions 
you can look at it and say, this is a good idea or this is a bad idea, or I like it, I don't like it. Um, and that's that's kind of the kind. And like like you say, Jonathan, I've done a, a on YouTube a, a, a series of videos that kind of explain all this, you know, A, B, C, D, E. Um, so anybody can look that up if they if they're interested. Yeah, and your. Although I think Instagram. I'm probably going to write an actual book about this and just call it, the, you know, go into some yes. de detail about it. Yeah, I would love to see an in-depth look into the fool's cap method. But um, there is like one week in the daily press field that's about the fool's cap method and kind of yeah. explains it in a week. Yep. Uh, so you've done it over and over. You've done this many, many times doing the fool's cap method, and now you do it in your head before you can you know, even anything makes it to the page uh, but for a newbie though for someone who's never done the fool's cap method before they never tried it and they do it let's say they do it the first time you got their first page they build it out they have their idea their whole idea on one page how do they how would you suggest they determine if it's worth committing all the time into writing like how can they really gauge that I mean, I, I think the whole the whole point of the fool's cap, Nick, is to because it's on one page, you have to really you have to con you, you're conceiving of the totality of it as you look at it. Like if, if we were like one of the examples I, I give is like if we were fool's capping Moby Dick, if we are Herman Melville and we're sitting down, you know, in 1836 or whatever, and we we go, uh Okay, who's the hero? It's Ahab, right? Who's the villain? It's the white whale. Um, what's the narrative device? It's told by uh, a seaman called Ishmael, the famous opening line, call me Ishmael. And, and when we do uh, act one, act two, act three, act one, the ship and Ahab set out in search of Moby Dick. Act two, they chase him around the world. Act three, they catch him and they duel him to the death. And then the final scene you know, Ahab is lashed to the whale, stabbing at him with a, with a harpoon as the whale takes him down, you know, sounds into, you know, obviously he's going to take him down to like 3,000 feet and that's the end of him. So if I'm Herman Melville, I look at that, I go, wow, that's a pretty damn good story. You know, <laughs> I, I can, you know, I can put myself in the in the uh, in the mind of a, of a potential reader and say, well, that should be pretty cool. But also, he can ask himself as a writer, do I want to do this? Is this fun to me? Does this sound like, and is it about something that I'm interested in talking about? You know, so I, that that's really kind of, you know, the whole point of it, to give you a bird's eye view in one page of the whole thing. Because sometimes we'll start out, well, like, I'm sure you guys do this exact thing. You fall in love with one element of an idea, right? maybe it's a character maybe it's some great scene and then but you don't look at the totality of it and you plunge in and like four months later you wake up and you say this goddamn thing doesn't work you know i've only got <laughs> half a story here right yep and, yeah, yep uh, so yeah that's the kind of the whole point of <laughs> of the fool's cap to make you see the whole thing yeah yeah you know and it can save you so much time uh, there was one of the, I, I, I'm so guilty of that. I got tons, like all writers, we all got like tons of ideas. And there was this one, it was book five in the heavenly realm series, even though the whole series was done. It was like this one that comes in the middle and I had the idea and I had 180 pages in the manuscript. I worked on it for like almost a year. And then I just like, I wasn't ready for it yet. And it was another 10 years before I was able to like sit down and actually come back to it and make it into something worthy of being finished and worthy of the time. And I think if I had fools capped it early on, I would have been like, mm, we're going to wait on that one a little bit. Huh. You know? Let me ask you this, Jonathan, what, what changed for you in those 10 years that made you ready to finish it? I learned more about, um, biblical mysteries and Christian uh -huh. esoterica stuff. Cause it's, you know, it's about like the wars between the angels. And this was like about a secret cadre of angels who uh, were like tasked with almost like recon in force kind of thing, uh -huh. but they were like off the books. It's uh -huh. kind of a, like a mission impossible <laughs> thing. Right. It was, and it was supposed to like intersect with all these biblical events, you know, like 
Moses crossing the Red Sea and, you know, the pillar of fire in the wilderness and uh, the passion and resurrection of the Christ and the empty tomb and the duel over Moses's body between Michael and Satan, you know, and all these different little elements that are pivotal, you know, and uh, following Abraham uh, as a patriarch, you know, through time. And uh, it was just like there were all these really interesting things, but I didn't know how to I didn't know what the theme should be. Um, so it took a lot of time of just growing as a person and, uh, um, uh -huh. you know, not, not just going through it. I went through a dark night of the soul. I went through a few years of, of shedding my faith and, you know, kind of being an atheist and just being like, this uh -huh. doesn't make sense. And so there was that internal thing, but also just learning more about the things that I wanted to talk about and just having the desire to not just write about this cool military unit, but like an actual story of like, okay, what's the, what's the overall point of this? What's the theme, right. you know? And, right. uh -huh. and so I had these two characters, like the, the theme was, which is better, you know, it, it's kind of a false binary to be a mystic or to be a scholar, you know, cause those are two kind of different, concepts at first mm -hmm. glance and they're represented by these two angels who are like best buds but they're totally different from mm -hmm. each other you know mm -hmm. and then i you know you go through that and there's there's like echoes of that in the bible where it talks about be hot or cold uh but i will spit the lukewarm from my mouth you mm -hmm. know yeah um and so it's kind of the you know one angel's struggle which i think is all of our struggles about how to like you know meld these two concepts together in a meaningful way and to kind of be a whole person you know there's that dichotomy that exists in us mm. so you know. sounds great yeah yeah it sucks but uh -huh. <laughs> but i figured it out so you know <laughs> well, how important uh this is something that i ran into doing my first fool's cap recently uh where i was forced to articulate what the theme was going to be. Yeah. What is the theme of this book? What is the point? What's the message? Yeah. Why am I here? Yeah. Why, 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 <laughs> why are, are you here as why, the reader? <laughs> why am I telling the story? What am I trying to affect in the reader? I, I had never started that way before. How important, uh, Steve, how important is the theme really to choosing whether or not it's, to pursue a yeah, book it's, idea? It's critical. And it's also the hardest thing of all, for whatever reason. Um, you know, it's like, um, I know I've told this story before, I think with you guys, but I'll tell it again. Yeah, the, Robert McKee, this, this comes from Robert McKee, the great screenwriting guru. And he tells a story about when he was a young actor, he got to interview Patty Chayefsky, who was the only screenwriter to win three Oscars for original screenplays, um, including um, Network, probably the most famous one. Yeah. And while he was interviewing um, Patty Chayefsky, Patty Chayefsky said, and, and McKee wrote this down and I've written it down. He said, as soon as I know what the theme of my play is, because he was basically a playwright, he says, I type it out on, on, a, on one sentence and I scotch tape it to the front of my typewriter. Mm -hmm. And after that, nothing goes into that page that isn't on theme. And... I thought, wow, that is great, you know? And in fact, um, Jack Carr, the guy who wrote The Terminal List and all, all of the James Reese um, yeah. thrillers, political thrillers mm -hmm. and military thrillers, he read that in something that I had written, and he, he, but he misunderstood it. This is kind of interesting. And he thought it wasn't a sentence. It was just one word. And so when he was writing The Terminal List, he just put the word revenge, and he put that at the top of his you know laptop screen <laughs> and he just said you know nothing goes into this story that isn't about revenge you know so um but it is really hard and a lot of times nick i find i i've written a book from start to finish and had no idea what the theme was and even when it was done i couldn't tell you what it was about i was just operating on instinct <laughs> the whole way in fact yeah. it would take it would usually be for me my great editor sean coyne yeah. who's also my business partner, He, when he would write, when he would do his editing of the thing, he would sort of tell me what the theme was. And, you know, he said, well, what this is really about, you know, is a, 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 a war between the scholar and the mystic. And I'd go, really? And he'd go, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, 
Um, so you're like it, a blind it, prophet, it, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. It's I mean, it's really hard to come up with this. Like, I will start a a, a file in my computer theme, you know, and I'll just, the first sentence will be, "What the hell is this damn thing about?" You know, and I'll sort of <laughs> yep. go, you know, and I'll try over and over and over to try to define it, you know. Um, but once you've got it, like let's say for like uh, McKee, when he would talk about this, he talked about the movie Casablanca, the Humphrey Bogart movie with. Um, Here's looking uh, at you, kid. What's her name? Uh, Ingrid Bergman, right? And let, the theme of that movie is it's better to sacrifice for the greater good than to follow your own selfish needs, right? Yeah. So once the writer, once you've got that, then you kind of know, oh, the final scene where Bogey puts Ingrid Bergman on the plane to Lisbon and he's, you know, and sacrifices her and then he goes off to fight the Nazis, you know? Ah, oh, I see. It's the the better, the greater good is better than him selfishly taking his girl and going off, you know. And so it really helps when you know what the what the theme is, but it's hard. Have there um have there been those experiences where you don't figure out the theme, but you look at a work and you say, Man, that's still a good time though. Like, can you have those empty calorie? And I don't want to say empty calorie. Maybe that's being too harsh. But can you have those kind of stories where there isn't a theme necessarily, but it's still meritous? I mean, yeah, I think. But they're the the bigger the theme, the greater the story. You know, and and a uh, 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 where there is no theme, where there's very little. That's like a lot of TV is like that. You know, yeah, a lot of TV episodes are really about nothing at all. You know, yeah, um, but. Uh, Think about a movie like The Godfather, you know, where the themes of family and the themes of, uh, you know, a uh, an ethnic group, the Italians that are kind of persecuted in a in a country that's, you know, where they're an immigrant group and they're still being, you know, they're not accepted. You can't be a senator. You can't be a whatever, you know, and how crime, you know, there's so many great themes in that thing. And that's what gives it its depth. Um, yeah. So. And it's longevity, like. Um, I've been rewatching Fringe, that TV show from uh, the late 2000s to 2012, uh, the kind of X Files ish show, you know, and um, with my buddy Will, who uh, best friend from high school, uh, he's the guy who genuinely, like, I'm not kidding you, he genuinely thinks King Kong Lives is an amazing script. I know, <laughs> like. You know, every time I mention this, I'm like, oh, I what know is, Steve probably thinks I'm teasing him, but no. Smoking? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair. That's fair because um, he's going to watch this and uh, I just uh, I, I want to be able to make sure I mention that. Um, but uh, watching it through his eyes has been really cool because I've started to notice the theme that you don't notice before. And there are a lot of things like sometimes the music's not great. Sometimes the special effects don't hold up or maybe the one off episodes are weird. But there's this underlying theme of the paternal dyad a father and his son and the love that a father has for his son. And he's willing to cross parallel universes and mm. create a Trojan war kind of scenario <laughs> if necessary to save his son. And, uh, and it, in going back and watching it, it's like, Oh, I can see it echoing here and here and all these episodes that I didn't really think had any merit to them because they have the theme in them. Mm. They carry so much more weight to mm -hmm. them, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, are you looking to actualize your inner Leonidas? Are you looking to find something for the Spartan in your life? Look no farther than Giordani Jovanovic. Giordani Jovanovic hair and skincare products made by real men for real men. Or as I like to say, be as sexy as you are deadly. Give 007 a run for his money. Awaken your inner John Wick with Giordani Jovanovic. Hair and skincare products. Um... You know, I want to ask you uh, just one thing about resistance. I know you talk about resistance all the time. So we always actually kind of try to avoid it, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> to give you a break. Yeah, to give you a to break. Talk about it. Uh -huh. um, but I do want to ask you one thing. Uh, has resistance ever been codified before the war of art came along? Because it seems like you're the first person to really give that enemy a name. You know, uh, I, I, I don't know of any that, I mean, obviously people have kind of talked about that subject, but yeah, I'm, 
I don't I don't know of any, Jonathan. You know, I think it seems crazy because it's such a universal phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't know of any. Yeah, I, I just uh, I'm reading it. And then I was reading excerpts. Um, I got this friend who owns this gun range and we do training classes together and uh, superb guy. We've had him on the show before, actually. Uh, Ginger Patriot. And uh, they're developing uh, the, they're developing this project that uh, that is in the gun industry that could be extremely lucrative, but he's been working on it for 15 years. And so I read a couple of entries to him uh, a couple of days ago from the daily press field, <laughs> you know, about like the bigger, the dream, you know, the bigger, the resistance, the, the, you know, the tree and the shadow, the tree and uh -huh. the shadow thing is one of the coolest things you've ever yeah. written. And, uh, and man, it just, it was like lighting a fire under him. I mean, he was worn out, dude, but <laughs> he heard that and, you know, uh, well, that's it's, good. It yeah, speaks to, to so that. many. Oh yeah. Well, it's just, it speaks to so many people. There are some real universal things. Um, I know Nick's got some questions. I, I do want to ask you though, in your, you can order just the book or you can order the deluxe package, which is uh, a limited quantity. Um, you have these illustrator cards. Uh, this kind of seems like a first for you as far as a, a deck of illustrations. Um, what gave you that idea, and uh, how did you find your illustrator? Ah, that's that's a great. I'm glad you. I'm glad you, you asked that, Jonathan, because the 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 book is illustrated by a wonderful illustrator named Victor Juhas, J U H A S Z, which you can look him up on Juhas Illustration. He's done things for Rolling Stone and New York Times. He's been a combat illustrator, you know, with the Marines and blah blah blah. You know, done all kinds of stuff like Ooh. that, and. Actually, Sean Coyne, my partner, uh, he introduced me to to Vic because uh, he had done another book with Vic, and um, so Vic, we he has one illustration for each week, so fifty two illustrations, and they were so good. I thought, like you can't quite see behind you, if get, get the get the uh, big box there, if, yeah, if sure. you would, Jonathan. So this is I don't know if you guys can see this. It's like a Cadillac crossing the desert with a giant antenna. And this it's yeah. a, that one is called yeah. dialing. It's cool. it's cosmic radio station. Anyway, Vic did so many such great illustrations that we thought, Diana thought, let's put them on a little deck of cards um, that people can then use as note cards. And I use them all the time because they're so they're so cool. I mean, they're really great little illustrations um, that are about something. I have a theme. And uh, so anyway, it was, and it was great, uh, great fun working with an illustrator and, um, and Vic is like top of the pops. Yeah. All of these cards they have, uh, well, they're just like pregnant with metaphor, you know, like the, the very first one on the deck here uh, that Nick has is what if no one likes it? And it's a guy standing on a rock hoisting alone in the middle of the ocean <laughs> hoisting his manuscript up to the o heavens offering it up to the heavens <laughs> yep and uh, dude it's so true what if no one likes it you know and now let me something... just say one thing about that jonathan like for yeah. vicks what what vic had to do he he had that week in the daily press field a text where the week said what if no one likes it right but then he had to come up with an illustration it wasn't like anybody told him what to do and so he thought he had to think of that illustration, which I think is a great example, right? The guy holding up the book to the heavens, you know, on this one <laughs> little rocky pile in the middle of an ocean, you know, because that's exactly what it feels like. But hats off to Vic for coming up with things like that. And he had to do that 52 times. And he, he did some amazing stuff, you know. That's a tremendous, so that's, that's a great tremendous fun artist. With him working with an illustrator. Isn't it amazing how, like, that's that's one of those things that seems even if you don't believe in anything supernatural or mystical, that is the art that is involved in that, that someone can take your written words or your idea and they can just pluck this image out of the ether, you know, and yeah, put amazing. it onto paper. Or think about, I mean, like, you know, in making a movie, the, the musical score. Yes. Who decides, you yeah. know, what the music is going to be, or, you know, uh, I was watching, um, not to get too esoteric here, but I was watching the movie for Moneyball. Baby. 
Oh yeah, yeah, Brad Pitt. great I don't know movie. If you've seen that, you know. Yeah, but there are certain scenes in the movie where they're they're trying to cue you, the audience, that uh, that uh, some real action is about to start here. You know, they and <laughs> they just do it with the like a single chord that you almost yeah. can't even hear for music. You know, you almost can't even hear, but it works like gangbusters. It's like suddenly you realize, ah. The mood is totally changed and now the energy is really going. And it's again, it's like, how do they come up with this? You know, it's just, you know, you or I can't do that. But somebody that's a great musical person. Can I'll tell you the one that it. God bless them. Yeah. It's like um, the theme to Game of Thrones. Uh, how do you do that? Like, dude, that's yeah. like a four or five novel series. And then this guy, the same guy who did the soundtrack for Pacific Rim, comes out of nowhere with this theme song for Game of Thrones and it's perfect. It's perfect. It's like, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. How does that happen? You know, I mean, if you're a, the director, you just get on your knees and say, thank God, to, you know, give this guy a, a fruit basket. You know, how did he do it? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, that always amazed me. Like um, when we interviewed uh, Roxanne, you know, Roxanna, uh, who's an illustrator, you know, and uh -huh. now she works a lot with the client when you hire her. She's uh -huh. like, what ideas do you like? But still, at the end of the day, she's got to come up with something on her own. And it's just it boggles. It boggles my yeah. noggle every yeah. time. You know, <laughs> it's probably just because she's really pretty. So my brain just uh -huh. right out, you know, but no, it's uh, I, I'm always a, a, just amazed at how people do that, you know, Um Anyways, yeah, I know we got a ton of questions, so and we got we're short on time. So well, I had three more questions for you, but they've they all had to do with the fool's cap method, and you already <laughs> answered them all <laughs> already. <laughs> uh, so I don't actually, um, I don't have any more written questions, but I would like to know. I, I think it'd be great for people to hear where they can find this this beautiful box set. Uh, where they could get a signed copy, or if they wanted to get just the book itself, uh, where would you direct people? Ah, okay. Uh, thanks for that, Nick. Uh, they can go to my website, which is just my name, stephenpressfield.com, and that'll redirect them to the to the bookstore. And there you can order the book itself, you know, signed by me and by Vic, or the special gift box that comes with all the stuff that's behind it. Or you can go to Amazon and order just, you know, just the book it's, itself, unsigned, or any other place like that. Uh, you know, Barnes & Noble, that kind of thing. All the usual suspects. Nice. But I highly recommend the, the signed copy. It's a better it's a better quality, and uh, in, in, any, in any way, it's got good juju. <laughs> it does. Um, it's got, uh, well, it's got so many goodies in it. The, the little uh, notebook is yeah, it's critical. Cool. It's Man, cool. I, uh, I love this thing. Uh, would you mind if I read you uh, just one or two of my entries or is that like sharing my no, please, secret diary with please you? Know? Do. Yeah, I'd be really curious. <laughs> so this is from day one, uh, real short. It says, um, I bought an LTD EX200 guitar rig today. I'm 40 years old. Are the motorcycles and guitar extensions of the midlife crisis, therapy outlets, or tools of resistance? Pandemonium Rising remains unfinished of its edits. This is the pen I use for those edits. <laughs> Irony. <laughs> I love That's it. That's exactly the, what it what it should be, Jonathan. Yeah, it's exactly what you should be writing down. You know. Yeah. That's you know. That self reflection that you're going through that nobody talks about, right? Nobody, yeah. nobody ever talk teaches you that. Nobody talks about it. But that's the difference between success and failure you know the processing of that stuff yeah so that's exactly right do you find um do you find working out in the mornings uh helps you maintain the discipline does it dovetail in with the discipline to write absolutely definitely yeah. I, because it's like a rehearsal for you know right for yeah. me working out it's it's uh something i don't want to do Right. I'm going to try to give every excuse in the world to get out of going there. <laughs> it's something I'm afraid of, just yeah. like writing. You know, am I going to get him under the squat bar? Am I going to be able to I can go down, but can I get back up? You know, and, <laughs> yep, in there. <laughs> and and it's something that hurts, you yeah. know, so it's just like writing. So by the time <laughs> I'm done with that and take a shower and go home, I feel like, OK, I've I've done this once already today. 
So when I sit down at the page, you know, maybe I've got a little momentum to get going. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Momentum. It's a rehearsal. Like, um, I, no, we got to let you go. But the, this one, I think uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, this was one that I thought you might enjoy. It's from day four. It says, uh, this is the insidious trap. Distraction. Victimless crime waiting for us every morning. Social media, the web, iPhone, all addiction. Addiction is a demonic pact. But the thing about addiction is that it's a blood oath. Your usefulness to it will outlast its usefulness to you. The demon has its talons in us. Smoking is mine. Palliative measure from a girl's heartbreak. I more or less got over the girl a decade ago. I still smoke. Miracles ah. needed. Discipline <laughs> is a muscle. We are all healthier when we are when we walk away or kill our addictions or at least starve them into atrophied submission. I know what I must do. Read, quit cigarettes, work out, no phone, web, social media. But we are lonely communal creatures. Ah. You know, when you get done with that book, you could probably publish that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I don't know about that. Was that was good man. stuff. Yeah, but that's yeah. that's the power of what you provide yeah. here. That's yeah. the beauty of it, you know. Wow. And another it's, it's and another the, uh... the, the whole concept behind journaling, right? That yeah. Yeah. when you when you actually sit down, you have to write something, you move into a different part of your brain than the resistance part of your brain. You move into the the witness part of your brain, you know, and that's mm -hmm. a good place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a quick a quick example on my end from working through this, you know, day by day. When, going back to filling out a fool's cap page for this idea that I had, and I forced myself to write the theme. I didn't, it wasn't very succinct. It wasn't just a sentence. It was uh -huh. actually a little, it was just a short little paragraph that I wrote as the theme. Um, but I went back and I read it and I read it and I reread it. And it's like the best thing I've written in over a year. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> believe I wrote it. I'm like, this is it. This is perfect. This is meaningful. This is exactly what a book should be about. Yeah, that's ah, exactly great. what people need to hear. Yeah. Wow. You guys you know? are smoking hot today. Yeah, hey, man. It's with your help, man. It's like yeah. the writer's devotional. You yeah. took you know? up the broken sword of your father. And <laughs> striking, striking down, down that darkness, darkness, baby. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> um, so well, this is powerful. This is powerful. It is. Yeah. Uh, and we want to thank you personally for uh, for bringing this into existence, Steve, because, you know, well, thank I know. Thank you guys for uh, having me on and uh, getting a little bit yeah. of the word out. Absolutely. Well, um, we're going to let you go. But before we do, like we always do with our guests, um, our motto on the Goslings is take up the broken sword of your father and strike down the darkness. Stephen Pressfield, author of The Daily Pressfield, any words of wisdom for our audience that they might go forth and strike down the darkness? Um, just what we were saying before that, like, actually, I was I was um, I did an event a couple of days ago with a friend of mine who wrote this book. The Sand Sea, which, as you can see, is like 700 wow. and something pages. And nice. this is while being a full-time lawyer, husband, father, and political guy. And one of the things he said was, steady effort over time is the superpower. A little bit every day, which is why the 365-day thing like the Daily Press Field, I hope, is helpful. But that's it. That steady drip, 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 you know, a drop of water on a stone finally wears it down. So, yeah, that's it. it. Go, go forth and drip. <laughs> <laughs> wear that, that down. I got to write that Wear down. that sphinx down with that water erosion. You go know? forth and that's drip. A, you know, there's, a, there's a great quote from um, uh, Glenn Cook's Chronicles of the Black Company where he says, enemy rests, but water never sleeps. So, uh -huh. drip. Yeah. The Daily Press Field. said Bruce Lee, yeah. Yeah, yeah be like water. Be like water. That's yeah. right. <laughs> All right. This is the book. Everybody can get it at stephenpressfield.com or at Amazon. We recommend everybody check it out. Thank you, as always. Steve, we always love talking to you. Thanks, Thank you, you guys. Buddy. My favorite nephews. And Until next time. Happy and holidays and all that kind of stuff. We'll see you in the new year. Happy Thanks, holidays, Steve. Uncle Christmas. Steve. We'll see you later. Okay. See you, buddy. Bye, Have guys. a good day. Bye. <laughs>
Hey guys, if you're enjoying this conversation, you like this interview and you want to hear some more of it, including some down and dirty stuff we're not allowed to say here on YouTube, head on over to patreon.com forward slash the goslings, sign up for one of our tiers and enjoy some exclusive content. That's right. And remember, keep it cool. And these are interviews that strike down the darkness. That's right, baby. A vertical punch. <laughs>